I've titled the sermon, Triple Threat, because that's what we'll see. Senbalat, Tobiah, and Geshem are the three main guys who are threatening the life of Nehemiah. And so if you haven't already, would you, would you please turn to, to Nehemiah chapter 6. Before we read God's holy word, here's a brief introduction for those of you who are new. Maybe this is your first time here. And here's a brief review for those of, of you who have been here. So what we want to do is we want to, to make sure that we understand context here. So text, God's word is king, context is queen. And that's why we seek to, to understand what happened before and what happened after so we can understand what's happening now. And so for, for the last few weeks, we saw that since God frustrated the enemy's plan of attacking from the outside, they resorted, the enemy resorted, now I'm speaking here of Satan, resorted to attacks from the inside. Do you remember what happened? The weapon of choice was greed and the nobles and the officials Greed motivated them to take advantage of the poor brothers and sisters. When, when that didn't work, because Isaiah brought internal reform, we saw examples of ungodly leadership and godly leadership. And godly leadership is marked by greed and its motivation is always for personal gain. Godly leadership we saw last week is marked by servanthood, generosity, compassion, and reverence that leads to care for the community. Do you, do you, did you see the difference? Ungodly leadership is motivated by greed that takes advantage of the community. Godly leadership is marked by servanthood, compassion, generosity, and reverence for God that leads to the care of the community. Today, we'll see that since the attacks from the enemies from the outside failed, today we'll see that since the attacks of the enemy, Satan, failed internally, we'll see that now the attack is going to, to be directed at an individual, namely Nehemiah. Do you see the big picture? The attacks came from the outside. God frustrated that plan. Satan, the enemy, shifted to the attacks from the inside with greed. That failed. Now, the strategy for the enemy is to attack the leader. Do you ever feel attacked personally? Yes, that's right. Sometimes Satan will attack an entire family. But sometimes Satan will single you out and attack you and attack me. Husband, are you under attack? Wife, are you under attack? Father or mother, are you under attack? Son or daughter, are you currently under attack by the enemy, that old serpent, Satan? Church leader, are you under attack? Christ follower, are you under attack? And the obvious answer is yes. And sometimes Satan will use the weapons of lies, fear, intimidation, slander, taunts, and bullying. That's what we'll see in our text this morning. That is what we're seeking to, to mine and to glean from God's word this morning because we are going to also glean and mine how God redeems 
his people from these attacks. If, if you and I are also under attack personally and individually, then what are we going to do? Nehemiah will show us two ways of how we are to respond when we are under attack that glorifies God. Would you stand with me? We're going to read God's holy word. Let's walk. Nehemiah 6, 1 through 14. Now when Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem the Arab and the rest of our enemies heard that I had built the wall and that there was no breach left in it, although up to that time I had not set up the doors and the gates, Sanballat and Geshem sent to me saying, Come and let us meet together in Hecaphirim in the plain of Ono. But they intended to do me harm. And I sent messengers to them saying, I am doing a great work and I cannot come down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and come down to you? And they sent to me four times in this way, and I answered them in the same manner. In the same way, Sanballat, for the fifth time, sent his servant to me with an open letter in his hand. In it was written, It is reported among the nations, and Geshem also says it, that you and the Jews intend to rebel. That is why you are building the wall. And according to these reports, you wish to become their king. And you have also set up prophets to proclaim concerning you in Jerusalem, there is a king in Judah. And now the king will hear of these reports, so now come and let us take counsel together. Then I sent to him, saying, No such things as you say have been done, for you are inventing them out of your own mind. For they all wanted to frighten us, thinking, Their hands will drop from the work, and it will not be done. But now, O God, strengthen my hands. Now when I went into the house of Shehemiah, the son of Deliah, son of Mehetabel, that one's questionable, sorry about that one, who is confined to his home, he said, let us meet together in the house of God, within the temple. Let us close the doors of the temple, for they are coming to kill you. They are coming to kill you by night. But I said, should such a man as I run away? And what man such as I could go into the temple and live? I will not go in. And I understood and saw that God had not sent him, but he had pronounced the prophecy against me because Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. For this purpose he was hired, that I should be afraid and act in this way, and sin. And so they could give me a bad name in order to taunt me. Remember Tobiah and Sanballat, O oh my God, according to these things that they did, and also the prophetess Noadiah and the rest of the prophets who wanted to make me afraid. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Caleb. Church, you can be seated. Would you pray with me? I feel led to pray for you. For, for the gift of illumination. A lot of times when we come to church and I've sat where you have under the preaching of God's word, I'm often distracted. My thoughts are, are not clear because of the cares and the worries of this world. And therefore I miss what God has for me when I do sit under the preaching of God's word. And I want to, to just ask the help of the Holy Spirit to to illumine our hearts and our minds to what he has for us this morning because i believe what he has for us is in great need in the midst of the battles that you and i wage against the evil forces of this place father we pause for a moment to ask for your help by the power of your holy spirit i pray that you would grant us the gift of illumination that you would clear every distracting thought, every worry, every trepidation. Lord, for, for those who are sleepy, we pray for a spirit of alertness. For those of, who are hungry to hear from, you, from your word, we pray that you would fill them with faith and hope and peace. For those who are being beaten down by the attacks of Satan, we pray that you would lift up and strengthen by your might and power. Lord, we pray that you'd help us to receive from you today 
by the, the work of your Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray for myself. I come behind this pulpit in weakness. Oh God, I need your help. Help me to handle your word rightly and faithfully and accurately. That it may be proclaimed with boldness and confidence in you by the power of the Holy Spirit. So that your church will be sanctified. And that your church will be edified. And that the name of Jesus will be magnified in our hearts and our minds. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Warren Wiersbe, a pastor and theologian, Bible scholar, once wrote, The average person doesn't realize the tremendous pressures and testings that people experience day after day in places of leadership. Leaders are often blamed for things they don't do and criticized for things they try to do. They're misquoted and misunderstood and rarely given the opportunity to set the record straight. If they act quickly, they are reckless. If they, they buy their time, they are cowardly or unconcerned. People in places of spiritual leadership not only have the pressures that all leaders face, but they must also battle and an infernal enemy who is a master deceiver and a murderer. Satan comes either as a serpent who deceives or a lion who devours. And so what did Nehemiah do when he was under attack? What we'll see here in our text is, is that he didn't leave the great work of rebuilding the walls and the gates and the doors of the temple. He didn't retaliate against his enemies. What did he do? He prayed. We can wage war against the enemies of the heavenly places by prayer. Here's the big idea of the sermon. When we are under attack by our enemies, now we got to remember here, church, Paul reminds us that our battles are not against flesh and blood, right? But it's against the, the spiritual forces of evil. Our battles are not against each other. Our battles are against the evil, the, the evil spiritual forces of this world, the heavenly places, the principalities. So when we are under attack, we don't have enemies like Sanballat and Geshem and Tobiah, right? We're under attack by Satan, that old serpent, who is a deceiver and a liar and a murderer. When we are under attack, what do we do? We are to pray for strength. And we are to pray for God to remember our enemies. Those are the two main headings. And I hope that as we walk through these verses, you'll see those headings in the text. You see, if you and I are faithfully serving the Lord... If you and I are faithfully living our lives for the Lord, then you have either been under attack in the past or currently you are being attacked or you will be attacked. When attack happens, what should we do? That is really the overarching question of our text this morning. Nehemiah gives us two answers. First, to pray for God's strength. And second, to pray to God to, to, for Him to remember our enemies and what they did. First, pray to God for strength. We'll be looking at verses 1 through 9 this morning. I want to root us in God's Word. So will you look with me at verses 1 and part of verse 2, the first part of verse 2 there. 
Now when Sunballat and Tobiah and Geshem the Arab and the rest of our enemies heard that I had built the wall and that there was no breach left in, in it, although up to that time I had not set up the doors and the gates, Sinbalat and Geshem sent to me saying, Come and let us meet together at Hakifarim in the plain of Anno. You see, church, what, when, when the enemies heard that the walls will, were rebuilt and repaired and the only thing that was left to do was to put up the, 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 the doors and the gates, it, it was looking like the, the Jerusalem city was going to be fortified against the attacks of the enemies. And you know what they did? The enemies shifted to desperation mode. Therefore, Sunballat and Geshem called for, as one author put it, a political summit in the plain of Anno. The plain of Anno would be considered neutral ground. And they're saying, come, take counsel with us, Nehemiah. Now, this was not a, a prayer summit, if you will. This October, I will go to Iowa to attend a prayer summit with a pastor friend of mine and his church. We'll all go away from the church building and we're all going to meet at a Christian church campsite where the agenda is this we're going to pray through scripture sing and then respond to God's leading by the power of the Holy Spirit for two and a half days there is no agenda except to pray through scripture worship God in song and then respond to God's leading. That's not what, what these, these leaders are inviting Nehemiah to go to. In fact, this was not even a political summit to offer terms of peace. This political summit, so to speak, is to do harm to Nehemiah. Let me put it bluntly. Bluntly. This, this summit at, at this, this proposal to meet in the plain of Anno is to kill him. Now, we probably should answer the question, why are these, these leaders so dead set, no pun intended, in killing Nehemiah and stopping the work of the rebuilding of the walls, the doors and the gates? Well, according to one commentary, the Bible doesn't, doesn't state it clearly, but Sunballat is actually the governor of Samaria. Tobiah was the governor of Ammon, and Geshem was the ruler of Arabian tribes that had taken over Edom and Moab. In short, they were all trying to protect their, their positions of leadership, and they were all trying to protect their personal gain. Do you get the strategy that these, these enemies are using? Let me put it in a simple way. You take out the leader and the work will stop. You get the strategy? If they can't defeat the remnant from the outside, if they can't defeat the remnant from the inside, take out the leader and the work will stop. Today, Satan is in the business of taking out spiritual leaders. He knows that if he can take out the, the spiritual leader, the gospel ministry can be crippled and the reputation of our Lord Jesus will be damaged. I'm not sure if any of you are privy to some of the things that are going on in the national Christian leadership of our country, but 
Many of the spiritual leaders in our country have fallen because of sin. Just to name three recognizable people, pastors who have been faithful for decades who have recently fallen due to sin. Satan loves to take out spiritual leaders. Dr. Tony Evans, who had a tremendous gospel ministry, a tremendous influence. Many people have benefited from his ministry, was removed from his own ministry. Pastor Alistair Begg, whom I respect, ended up stepping down from his ministry. And lately, Dr. Steve Lawson, a great expositor of God's word, stepped down or, or either removed from his ministry. That's just three. With discernment, Nehemiah knew they intended to do him harm. Do you see that in verse 2, part B? Therefore, he sent, messenger, uh, he sent a message saying, I am doing a great work, and therefore I cannot come out to you guys. Verse 3. You see where we're at? Verse 3. You see, Nehemiah was focused on what God had given him to do. He called it great work. Do you know why he called it great work? The repairing of the walls, the repairing of the temple was in actually preparation for the king who was to come, the promised Messiah, Jesus Christ. And he refused to be distracted from his great work. It's the same for you and I today. We are doing a great work building up the, the body of Christ in preparation for our Savior's return. Amen. Church, what great work has God called you to do that you should stay focused on doing? Husbands and wives, do your great work in fighting for your marriage. Moms and dads, do your great work in parenting your children. You see, secularly speaking, we know that the fabric of a healthy nation depends upon healthy marriages and healthy parenting. Marriage and parenting are both hard work, but they are great work. It takes great work, but it's worth it. It can produce healthy homes which will transform an entire neighborhood, which will transform a city, which will transform a state, which can transform an entire country. Husbands, wives, parents, moms and dads, do your great work. Don't be distracted by the things of this world. Amen. Spiritually speaking, spiritual leaders, continue to do your great work in your ministries, which can transform a church to be a healthier church, which can transform a community, which can transform a city. You get the pattern. Spiritual leader, continue to do your great work. We are a healthier church today because of the spiritual leaders who serve sacrificially and generously. You see, when we resist the enemy, the enemy will respond with persistence. I want us to see it's, it's not specifically said in our text, but you see the, the, the root of persistency in not only in the enemy, but also in Nehemiah. Look with me at verse 4. The enemy sent for Nehemiah how many times? Four times. You're with me. You're actually with me. That's good. But Nehemiah also resisted with persistence. 
Church, when Satan tempts you to sin and you resist for the first time, Satan, with persistence, is going to come back and tempt you again and again and again. When this happens, we need to meet Satan's persistence with our own persistence. That is what Nehemiah is trying to show us this morning. There is a real battle that is going on. And our enemy is persistent. And so therefore we must be, by the power of the Holy Spirit, be equally persistent. Fight the enemy's persistent with godly persistence. James 4 verse 7 says this, The devil, or resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Again, with persistence, send Ballot for the fifth time uh, sent his servant to Nehemiah with an open letter to, to take counsel with them. Verse 5. Again, after four tries, send Ballot and Geshem sent this letter that, that Nehemiah said was an open letter. Here's what it said. Look with me at verses 6 and 7. It is reported among the nations, and Geshem also says it, that you and the Jews intend to rebel. That is why you are rebuilding the wall. And according to those reports, you wish to become their king. And you have also set up prophets to proclaim concerning you in Jerusalem. There is a king in Judah. And now the king will hear. That's King Artaxerxes, the king of Persia, who sent him. To rebuild the walls. And now the king will hear these reports. So now come and let us take counsel together. What I want us to see is that when, when Nehemiah was equally persistent with his enemies, the, the, the enemy resorted to intimidation. In the old days, it was common for for nobles to, to send letters to other nobles. But those letters were, were usually folded or rolled up and sealed with, a, with an unbroken seal. Here's what one author said about the, the open letter. To, to send an open letter to, to a, an official government was nothing more but intimidation and insulting. You see, back then in an open letter, it would be equivalent to, you know, emails. I think some of you still work, use emails. Most of you just use text. But in an email, you can, in a, in a big group of email or a big distribution list, I email about 228 pastors every week. One can choose to reply all. Because I email with what, what they call um, blind courtesy copy. I just don't want everyone to, to see um, everybody else's personal email information. So I, I email with a blind courtesy copy so that no one can, can see. But someone can, can reply all and then everybody gets the reply. That's what an open letter, how it functioned back then. Anybody who got a hold of that open letter was able to read it. And you know what it said in verses 6 and 7. All kinds of lies. And whoever read it would know what, that, what, what, what those lies are about. And so this was nothing more but intimidation. To intimidate someone is to cause someone to fear. And they also used an old tactic. These, these enemies used an, an, an old tactic that worked in the past. Now, some of you weren't with us when we covered Ezra chapter 4, but briefly, let me explain. A letter was also written by the governors and the officials back in Ezra chapter 4 to the king, Artic. Arte Artaxerxes himself that, that really just described that when the remnant were rebuilding the, the temples and, or the temple and, and the, the altar, that they were rebuilding a city that had one time rebelled against the king. 
And so King Artaxerxes made an order to search the, the, the decrees, the, the records, and it was found that this city was once inhabited by kings who rebelled, by evil kings. And because that was recorded, the king caused the rebuilding to stop. Do you see the strategy? It's the same thing in verses 6 and 7. And so back to Nehemiah. What, what is the king going to do if, if he read this open letter? Is he going to bring a great army of, in Persia, from Persia, and bring death and destruction to the temple and its people? But Nehemiah was just equally persistent. Therefore, you and I, when we are under attack by the enemy, we must be equally persistent in our fight against the enemy. He told them that you're nothing but liars and everything that you wrote in that open letter are all lies. He said, verse 8, no such things as you say have been done, for you are inventing them out of your own mind. Huh. Great language, right? Let, let me put it in, in our terms. You're just lying. Do you ever battle against the lies of Satan? Yeah. When you do, when you are engaged in a full-scale battle against Satan, what do you do? How do you fight back? You see, sometimes these lies have somewhat of a small aspect of truth in them. Do you ever, you ever think about that? Yeah. Yeah. When, when Satan accuses you of lies, when you think about it, honestly, there's, there's some truth to that. You see, when we get attacked in that way, and accuses, and we, we, we get accused by certain lies, and we do see, yeah, yeah, that, that's true. What do we do? We fight back with truths of who we are when we are hidden in Christ. Let me, let me give you some examples here. Sometimes I'll just be doing my thing at home, and Satan will put in my mind a thought, Alex, you are weak. You see, I am a leader in the home, as a husband and a father, I'm a leader in the church. Oftentimes, Satan will accuse me of my weakness, which is true. I am weak. So how do we fight back? But in my weakness, church, but in your weakness, God's power is made perfect. You see that? 2 Corinthians 12, 9. This is how we fight back. Alex, you're worthless. And, and at times I can agree. I'm worthless because I fall short of the glory of God. But because of God's love and mercy and grace for you and me, he has made us a child of the king. We see this in John chapter 1, verse 12. Don't ever forget your worth. Amen. If you are in Christ Jesus, then you are a child of the king. Not just an earthly king, but the king of the universe. This is how you and I fight against the attacks of the enemy. Alex, you are unworthy. You are unworthy to be Melinda's husband. She's a gift to me. You're unworthy to be the father of three boys. You're unworthy of being the pastor of this church. Yeah, you're right. I am un unworthy, Satan. Because I do sin. I do fall short of the glory of God. But now... I am in Christ Jesus. Amen. The old me is gone. The new me is here. It, it's come. 
2 Corinthians 5.17. And it's true for you as well. Church, our worth is not found in us. Our worth is found in Christ Jesus, who laid down his life for you and me. In that open letter, full of lies, there was a certain aspect of truth. The Old Testament um, had Old Testament prophets, pro prophets who prophesied that there will be a king. And so in, in that open letter, there, there is a measure of truth. There was a king who was to come. And later, we know that the, the end of that story is Jesus, the Messiah, the king of the universe, the son of God, the redeemer, did come. He did come. And Israel's leaders opposed him. The devil tried to stop him. The people accused him of blasphemy and opposing the Roman taxation. In the midst of opposition, he didn't stop his great work of salvation. Do you understand the connection here? From Nehemiah to the work of Jesus. Nehemiah was just a, 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 a type. He was a, a pointer to the one who comes. Nehemiah didn't stop his great work of the, rebuilding the wall. Here's what he was pointing to. When a true king came, he didn't stop his great work either. His great work of salvation. You see, in the face of opposition... Luke tells us in chapter 9, verse 51, when the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. He, Isaiah would tell us that he set his face like a flint. He set his face like a stone to go to Jerusalem to accomplish his great work of salvation, and he did it in three days. What did Nehemiah do when he was constantly under attack by his enemies? He prayed. He prayed a short prayer. He prayed to God to strengthen his hands Crosswalk. That is what you and I are to do when we are under attack. We are to pray for God to strengthen our hands. Why? Because it is the Lord who is our strength. Psalm 18.1. We go to his word and we find that our strength is the Lord. The psalmist tells us that the Lord is your strength and your weakness. Psalm 68 verse 35 says this. You God are awesome in your sanctuary. The God of Israel gives power and strength to his people. When you are weak, under attack, you can pray for God to strengthen your hands. And where can you find that strength? In the Lord. In God, who is awesome and great in power, who gives power to his people. One more, we are to be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Brothers and sisters in Christ, when you are under attack by Satan and he has weakened you, pray, pray for strength to, to fight back. Remember, victory is yours in Christ Jesus. What else should we do when we are personally attacked by the enemies? We pray for God to remember our enemies and what they did, the things they did. That's the second main heading. We'll be looking at verses 10 through 14, and then we'll close. You see, there was another attempt to take out or snuff out or kill Nehemiah. This time it was through a prophet. When Nehemiah went to Shemaiah's house, he, he prophesied to Nehemiah that, that, that there are people who's going to kill you. 
They're coming at night in the dark cover of darkness, and they're going to kill you. Did you notice the emphasis there on that word kill in just those two short verses? So Shemaiah said, let's, let's meet in the house of God within the temple and then close the doors behind us. Verse 10, you see where we're at? After the repeated threat and intimidation and attempts to, to kill Nehemiah, I, if I were him, I would probably te be tempted to just run to the temple and throw myself at the mercy of God. That, that's just me, but that's, I'm not Nehemiah. Ne Nehemiah did something different. He said, should, should such a man as I run away? And what man such as I could go into the temple and live? I will not go in, verse 11. Even though Shehemiah seemed like a man of God because he was a prophet, something didn't add up right. You see, Nehemiah had no business going into the temple. He knew that. He, he wasn't a priest. He wasn't a Levite. He was the governor of Jerusalem. He knew the law of Moses, remember? Numbers 18 verse 7 says, An outsider who comes near shall be put to death. Do you remember what happened to King Uzziah when he entered the temple of God? Azariah and how many priests? 80 priests went against him strongly and ushered him out of the temple. And when he became angry, King Uzziah became angry. Do you remember what happened? God struck him with leprosy on his forehead. And he eventually died a leper. If Nehemiah went into the temple to save his life, then what would that look like to the people? It would give them reason to think that he was guilty of all the, the charges. You see, what Shemaiah was doing was he was seeking to discredit Nehemiah. Do you ever feel like you are being discredited at work? Do you ever feel like you're being discredited at home with your young children? That even though you work hard to parent them, it's a great work and things still don't go wrong. I mean, still, things still go wrong. That's like, I'm just not good enough. I'm not cut out for this. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your honesty. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> I think we're all thinking that. Thanks for just saying it out loud. You know, oftentimes we feel like we're failures. That's why our hope is in the one who redeems. We have no power to lead and, and lead our children to salvation and actually um, somehow create salvation in them. We're, 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 that's not our job. That's the Savior's job. Our job is to parent faithfully, though we're going to fail. Sometimes we'll, we'll feel discredited, uh, we'll, we'll feel intimidated, we'll feel like we're failures. Things weren't just, just weren't adding up with Shemaiah. Verse 12 says, And I understood and saw that God had not sent him, but that he pronounced the prophecy against me because of Tobiah and Sinbalat that had hired him. You see, prophets were supposed to be the mouthpiece of God. They were supposed to be the, the spokesperson for God to, 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 to correct the people of God, to, to bring reproof and rebuke. But some prophets were ungodly prophets. Some prophets were for hire. Shemaiah is the prime example. He was corrupt. You see, in the church age, in, in our age, the Apostle Paul tells us to not quench the Holy Spirit. I love that I heard that prayer this morning. And we are not to despise prophecies, but to test everything that we hear. 
and then hold fast to what is good. You see, we are to test every prophetic word because we only see in part, therefore we only prophesy in part. For, that's 1 Corinthians 13, 9. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 14, 3 that prophecy is for the building up of the body for the encouragement and consolation of the church. You see, Nehemiah knew that, that, that the law of Moses, therefore he was able to discern that Shemaiah's prophecy was false. And so what did he do when he was again under attack, this time by prophet? He prayed. He prayed. He prayed to God to remember Tobiah and send Balak, to remember Noadiah and the rest of the prophets who wanted to make him afraid. Nehemiah didn't take matters into his own hands. Instead, he, he prayed. He, he prayed for God to remember them, to remember what they're doing. You see, this shows us that he was completely trusting in God and for him to be the one to bring judgment. Different scholars would have different interpretations of his prayer. Some scholars would say that he prayed a prayer of imprecatory prayers. That's to pronounce curses upon the people, the enemy, by God. Some Scholars would say that this short prayer, which, which, uh, which other scholars would say was a telegraph prayer, was a prayer for vindication for himself. No matter where you land in your interpretation, here's the simple fact. When Nehemiah was attacked consistently and persistently. What did he do? He prayed. What did he pray for? For strength. Where does the strength come from? The Lord. Did he take matters into his own hands when he was attacked by the prophet? Shemaiah? No. What did he do? He prayed. What did he pray for? For God to remember his enemies, and the things that they did against him. What do we do? We pray. When we allow God to do what he does, we continue to do what he's called us to do. We can do so because Christ died for us. When he ascended to heaven, he sent the helper, the Holy Spirit, who now indwells in us to give us power to defeat the attacks of Satan, the evil spiritual forces, the principalities of this world, for the glory of God, for your good and my good, for the namesake of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It is in his name we can find protection, deliverance, and victory in the midst of being attacked. This is why we show up every Sunday to hear from his, his word, to be encouraged by his word, to be equipped by his word, because we're a needy people and we have a great king. And he's given us the power for victory in Christ Jesus. That's why he deserves all glory. That is why he's worthy of our praise. That is why it's worth it to, to, to surrender our lives and serve him, to build up his kingdom. Worship leaders, will, worship, worship team, will you please join me on the platform? I don't know about you, but after spending some time in God's word and just seeing who God is, what he has done and who I am, 
and in my great need and how he has provided, though not every aspect of my life is perfect, he has protected me through all kinds of dangers and peril because he has called me to do the things that he's called me to do, just like he's called you and I, you, you to do some things, great work. And so church, pray. Pray for strength and pray to God to remember and he'll do it. Would you stand with me?